Okay, sorry about all the confusion. I don't know why this decided to give me fits today. But good morning. All right. Can you folks on Zoom hear me okay? Okay, you guys can see it. Uh, you guys see the... All right, good. So this will just be fun trying to do back and forth. So, All right. Well, anyway, so many of you have probably already been through this buyer agency agreement class where we've gone over what this document looks like. So today I wanted to just kind of share a little bit more about kind of the things that are going on, because those of you that may not have been at our team meeting uh, don't know that uh, August 17th is when the commissions will be coming out of the MLS. Um, but more importantly as well, that is the time when we either have to have our own buyer agency document taken care of, or we're going to be utilizing this one, which will be tweaked by the state. So I'm not meeting with our attorney until later today to find out what our best practice is going to be. And I'll be honest, uh, I've had mixed feelings about this particular document. Uh, some people like that you can email and get out of it. Some people don't like that. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what the best recourse is for somebody to get out of this, but we definitely need to have an out because there's going to be times you want out as well. <laughs> um, and so we just have to make sure that we can get out of it in some form or fashion. The other thing is a lot of people are asking the question, well, what do I do if I want to reduce my commission or change my commission or something like that? And right now the answer is you're not allowed to, but again, as I mentioned, agents are savvy. So I can imagine you canceling this agreement via email and then signing up for another one, will that work? I don't know. And who gets that paperwork? So we're going to have to figure that out. But I guess by a show of hands or just, you know, kind of talking out loud, how many people would prefer that this is an exclusive agreement between us and our buyer? A non-exclusive agreement. And for those of you on Zoom, you guys can either raise your hand or put in the chat uh, either way. But curious to find out whether we think exclusive or non-exclusive. The difference is really this. If you have an exclusive buyer agency agreement uh, in place, then that's exclusive to you and this brokerage. Do we have a problem? Okay. I'm not here. Well, you're here to fix things. So I'll let you do that. Yeah. Is that what we're talking about here? So in this document, there is a default that would show. Yeah. Thank God for Amanda and Cassandra. I don't know where I'd be. Woo. All right. Um, so exclusive would mean that it is exclusive and it's binding to this brokerage. And getting out of it means that there has to be a way for a consumer that's unhappy with their experience to remove themselves from this exclusive buyer's agency agreement, right? And I have seen some that say you have to go to, not orientation, but you have to go to mediation to get out of it, which I think is a little crazy. Uh, I have seen like this one shares that you would just email the agent and say you want out of it. Uh, but the same goes for you as the agent, right? You're, there are going to be times where you don't want to deal with a buyer anymore because they've made you angry and you're just upset. They won't listen to you and you want out of it. How do we want to get out of that with them, right? So that's the question is, if we make it non-exclusive, they could be working with multiple realtors. And I don't really think that's the best practice. And if we make it exclusive, what's the best way to get out of it? Some people think that email is just too easy to get out of uh, by simply sending an email. So the question is, do we have any options of or thoughts as we're going to be meeting with the, our legal counsel later today that we might propose? Diana? One question. So if you're under contract exclusively, mm -hmm. and they send out, do you still have procuring cause if they write on that house with another agent that you have shown it? If you let them out of the buyer agency agreement and they decide whether you let them out because you didn't want to work with them anymore or they didn't want to work with you anymore, it's going to be the series of events that led up to the offer. So procuring cause, everybody thinks that just because you show a house is procuring cause, and that's not necessarily true. I could go show a client a house right now and never speak to them again for the next three weeks, and all of a sudden they write an offer on that property and it's successful with another agent. I can claim procuring cause, but nine times out of 10, the board is going to say, no, you're not procuring cause because you abandoned this consumer. 
you showed them the house and you had no follow through whatsoever. You never communicated any other homes via email. You never text them, no phone calls, and you never showed them anything else. So would I be procuring costs? That's a great question. We're procuring costs. You showed that to them, you showed them other homes, and for whatever reason, they decide they want out of the exclusive with you. And then they go with another agent. You could be procuring cause, yes, but then we have to take that to the board and it has to go through the panel, the arbitration panel, and then they would decide. So that's, I think, the biggest conversation piece here is what does it mean to be an exclusive agreement? And if you get out of it, how does that, how do you still get paid if you've worked with this consumer? And I think that's going to be the thing to your point is there are going to be consumers that are going to do that. And as real estate professionals, there's nothing in this agreement that tells us that we have to work with another brokerage or pay any referral fees of any kind if they saw another house with somebody, right? Because this is only with the consumer. We're gonna have to learn to work together somehow as real estate professionals to figure this out because I can guarantee there's that's going to happen. And do I have an answer? No. You know, I ask if, if somebody calls me and if they mention they have seen a house with somebody, I usually say, look, if you saw that house with that agent, mm -hmm. That should be that house. Well, you might be more ethical, perhaps, or yeah. whatever than some agents. Well, so my thought on this is, and like I said, we've kind of reviewed the document for the most part. We we will review it, but the question I have too is, so it sounds like exclusive. We want an exclusive agreement. We've all kind of agreed on that. Yes? Okay. And we know that there has to be a way out of it. We just don't know the best way out of it. If a consumer wants out, what do we feel like is the best avenue? And then we'll move on to that piece. Well, currently, so I just got a referral from a client colleague um, who was a senior emergency, terrible experience, got released. It didn't seem that difficult. I mean, it wasn't an email, but it was a client form. Okay. Um, but you're saying that's too difficult. Like, is that too much? No, no, no. So you're thinking a signed form that says that they've elected. They're taking it off the market. Well, that's a listing is different. This is buyer. Yep. You could have you could have an agreement that that would allow a buyer to get out of this exclusive agreement. Sure, you could. Um, everybody would have to sign it. And I can pretty much bet what happens when they don't want to sign it. Where do we go from there? Because we have plenty of people that don't want to sign documents. And so, yeah, the consumer guide even. So is there a spot that we say refuse to sign? Perhaps. <laughs> Uh, I don't mind the email, but like I said, I've heard your feedback from agents and a lot of agents don't like that. So go ahead. However, I also understand, is, like, would there be a way that we could, could there be additional verbiage around like commission or payment? Like, you know, if that agent you know, if it's the buyer that wants, if it's us that want out of the relationship, then I think we at that point understand that we're going to have to walk away without being paid. For those of you on Zoom, I'll fill you in here in a second. Um, moving forward, or just maybe, you know, see the house with somebody else. I don't know what the situation exactly is, but is there a way to say, like, if you have shown them three or more houses or whatever, then they owe you a flat fee at least? And the collection of that flat fee happens how? <laughs> it's great. It's great. So before we get too, too far, because these are great things. So uh, I want to fill in the people on Zoom. So the, the question is basically, could we maybe be like an attorney and we would get a deposit? Um, or uh, would we say that they owe us a minimum commission if we work with them and show them three or more houses or whatever and they, they want out of the transaction? So this goes back to the same thing that it will always go back to. The broker is the only one that can sue the consumer or go after them for this money. So I ask you the question in this room and the folks on Zoom, if Melissa Sanford comes to me and says, I don't like the fact that this client, I showed them 15 houses and they didn't pay me. I want you to go after them for $2,500. And I do that. How are the rest of you all going to feel when it shows up on social media that the broker of Legacy Group decided to sue a consumer for a house they didn't buy? Not gonna like it. 
right? It's going to hurt your business. So I don't think that we're in a position yet until another brokerage wants to take that on first and we're not the, the, the first ones to do that. I would say, in my opinion, I do not think that that is going to be something that we would want to do. Nope. Each agent cannot have their own process. This is a brokerage level thing. So I don't want to say that we as agents don't matter, but in the eyes of the state, we don't matter. The client belongs to the broker, not the agent. And so unfortunately, it can't be on an agent per agent basis. And besides that, they're going to go to social media and blow up Keller Williams as a whole anyway, right? It's not going to be just legacy group. So Stephanie Webb on Zoom is asking if I can repeat the question. So basically, there was just an agent in the room that was sharing with us um, her thoughts on why we might want to do either a retainer fee and or a minimum commission for showing three or more properties or something like that. And the answer, like I said, it's not that it's not a great question or a great opportunity. The problem is we would have to sue them and that's not going to go very far as a brokerage. Um, as far as the consumer trying to get out of the contract to, to what you're saying is it would depend upon the situation. Well, the same is true with the listing. Just because an agent wants to give up a listing or a consumer doesn't want a listing, as the brokerage, we have the opportunity that I can take it if if the Killy team says, hey, these people are awful, I don't want to deal with them anymore, and they don't want to deal with me, I can absolutely then say, okay, let's give that listing to somebody else within the brokerage. That's well within our right. It doesn't typically happen because usually that person is so irritated with us as a brokerage, they don't care anything about another agent. They just want a different company, right? And so it's not that that's not an opportunity that we can explore, sure. I don't want to focus too, too heavily on getting out of this. I just wanted to get a feel for what your thoughts were, because as we go through this document, you're going to like things and you're not going to like things. And so I'm just trying to figure out what you like. It's in writing. It is in writing. It's in... Right. Yeah. Antonio. We have a mutual release form. Yeah, we have, we could do a different form. I, I'm surprised to hear anybody say that because usually agents are like, oh my God, don't give me another form. So I'm just surprised that anybody would want another form to send to their consumer to sign. But the question is, could we come up with a form like a mutual release? And the answer is yes, we we absolutely could. <clears throat> yeah. okay. Sure. Almost like an exit survey. Almost like an exit survey. Email. Yeah, I'm I'm questioning. I think that there should be, in my opinion, something on this form with a checkbox with an initial next to it. I want to see your thoughts on this. I think the consumer should initial when you have them sign this that they're not working with another agent. Like not just a not just a question are they on here, but they need to initial next to it saying I'm not working with another agent. Yeah. Okay, so I like that. Well, we could do a couple questions. We we could do a, a couple questions. We could say, have you looked at any other property with any other agent? Well, they're going to know. Well, working with is a very, working with is a definition that the House Bill 466 states what it is. I mean, it specifically states working with an agent is being shown any property, so touring property, getting into a listing of any kind, talking about financing, any of that. So the definition will need to be on there of what it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Typically, yeah. <laughs> Typically, we don't get paid unless you buy a house, right? Everybody, that's, that's... Are the buyers going into the price of the house? It's just additional. Now, no, like... the buyer side. So uh, this is what I can share with you. And I think I shared a little bit at team meeting. Um, coming back from D.C. where the legislative meetings, they have, when I say they, NAR has specifically stated that they have spoken with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the lenders. There will not be any discussions about financing our commission into the purchase of a property because it would be considered a personal loan, not a loan for a home. And so there will be no conversations about that whatsoever in the near future. So we will not be financing or the buyer will not be financing our commissions into the sale of their home unless it is a concession that is written by the agent that says that the seller has agreed to pay X amount of commission at this purchase price. That's going to work for some of the time. It's not going to work for all of the time. Okay. Um, one of the things also coming out of DC that I will share with you is VA. If anybody has any ideas on VA buyers, I would love to hear it because as of right now, you cannot charge a VA buyer any commission whatsoever. We can't even charge them the additional commission fee. So while people may think that they help the consumer with this lawsuit, they really have hurt the consumer, but they've even hurt veteran buyers even worse, right? So as of right now, I just make it a blanket statement. You, you're not going to be able to procure a commission if you work with a VA buyer, making them pay it in the current form. You can maybe get a seller to pay a commission, perhaps, but the buyer cannot pay a commission. So when we change our purchase agreement, not as of yet. I had an agent reach out to me earlier uh, and they tried to write in the commission under additional terms. Until August 17th, we really don't have to do anything on the purchase agreement asking for commission because the contract for you to get paid is still the MLS. Okay. So when that changes, the seller will then be paying us the commission if they're paying us a commission or the buyer. As of right now, even though we don't explain it the proper way, currently, a listing broker pays your commission when you're a buyer's agent. Not the seller, not the buyer. The listing broker pays you the commission. It just so happens that real estate agents wanted to be paid faster. And we've kind of hurt ourselves with that because instead of all of the money coming to Coldwell Banker and then Coldwell Banker sending us a check or a wire and then you getting paid, the title company said, hey, I'll split it up on the settlement statement for you. So it looks like the seller is paying two companies commission. So when people say the seller paid the commission, it's because of the way we have done it for so many years on the settlement statement. Had we been doing it in the opposite, which is probably looking back, we probably should have, which is where all the money went to the other brokerage or our brokerage. And then we sent a check the seller would understand better that they're paying one brokerage all the commission and then what we do with the other half is up to us. It may not have changed things, but I just throw that out there to tell you that I've heard I've heard other brokers recently say, well, the buyer really pays the commission now anyway because they bring the, the money for the purchase price. I've heard them say the seller pays it because it comes out of the seller proceeds. I don't, I, I think the seller has always paid it. My, I do not think the buyer pays it. We have a couple of questions in the room. Go ahead. Diana, and then next to you. So, August 15th, I write an offer. Yep. I'm not putting any commission in because it's still going to come from the MLS, correct? No, as of August 17th, the commission will come out of the MLS, and it might even happen before that. So, so that when you... Put it in the well, we're going to have a different purchase agreement. We'll have a different purchase agreement probably in July, before August ever comes. So we're working on listing agreements right now. We're working on purchase agreements. That's why I'm soliciting more questions or answers from you guys, I, I should say, rather than having this class specifically on this because you're learning as much as we're learning and they're learning at NAR as much as we are. I mean, there's nobody that has all the answers, but I can say this. Many companies will come up with their own form. This is not going to be a standard form. It is not required by the division to provide a form of any kind. Each company can have their own. I have seen non-exclusive agreements. I've seen exclusive agreements. I've seen where you have to go, like I said, to uh, mediation to get out of an agreement. 
there's all kinds of different ones that we're going to see. And that's why I'm trying to figure out what is the best for us. We will be changing the purchase agreement and the listing agreement as well so that you're well prepared before August 17th comes around. Okay. You had a question. Uh, well, I'm just newer and I'm kind of wondering why this even came up to take up in lawsuits or lawsuits. Right? There were multiple lawsuits, what yes. Just a brief cycle. Sellers felt that they didn't want to pay the commission. They thought that the buyer should pay their own commission. That's all. That's really all it comes down to. Um, we don't have a default future state. I've checked with Keller Williams International, and right now they don't have any answer for us. Post August 17th, my thought on this is until we get a system, and perhaps we'll have one by then, I don't know. Uh, I think you're going to have to call the agent or email the agent or text the agent and ask, what's the commission that you're offering? And I had an agent say to me, well, I would have to do that on six listings I'm going to go show. I don't know that I'd be calling on them just to go show them. I'd be waiting until I actually have a buyer that's ready to write on one, and then I would call that agent. That's just my personal opinion. No, the listing commission is not negotiable. The listing commission, so you have to call the agent. You have to call, you have, so the question is, how do you know what the commission is? Guys, you have to call the agent. You have to call the broker, or there's going to be something online that we can go to at their company that's going to offer what that that is. We don't know. Well, you need, that's why the buyer agency is coming out. That's why you need the buyer agency. So the question is, so I just have to take the 1% that the seller's offering. Well, I think, like I said, this is not a bad thing. Like it is weird and it's different, but right. The good thing about this is you're not going to have that conversation now. You're not going to go to a listing and go, oh, they're paying 1%. I'm only getting paid 1% on a $300,000 house. No, you're going to know up front when you negotiate this with your buyer. I'm getting paid 3% commission, whether it's coming from the buyer or the seller or a combination of both on any property that they purchase, right? This is a good thing. It's just different because you now as an agent and including myself, we now have to negotiate our value up front when we walk in the door to meet with somebody. Well, Of course, we're going to run into problems. I mean, this is new to everybody, but yes, we. This is that's why it's that's why we're having these discussions. It's really to figure out you might have a better idea than I have, or somebody else in the room or on Zoom could have, and that's why we're having this discussion. And what we're seeing now, that's why some buyers are over they're looking around the house and they want to beat the August. Uh, yeah, there are buyers out there looking right now that want to try and beat the August deadline of having to pay an agent. It's the communication, but it's going to be this document that communicates it. And so that's the question. So um, many of you have heard, I wanted to cover this too. Uh, I think Melissa Sanford shared it with me. You're just, I see you right in the middle of my screen. So I could just keep saying Melissa Sanford, but uh, she shared with me the other day, the Zillow, the seven day touring agreement. Is there anybody in the room or on Zoom that, at, that uses Zillow, that pays for leads through Zillow, that they sent you this form? that they would have sent you their touring form because you are signed up as a premier agent with Zillow. They must not like you, Nick. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so uh, Melissa got the email from them, which we've seen the document, but she emailed the document. And basically, if you're working with Zillow or any Zillow agent, they have what's called a seven-day touring agreement, which is a non-exclusive 
agency agreement. It is not an agency agreement at all. It's just an exclusive seven day touring agreement that says that you are going to work as a consumer and the agent are gonna to work together to tour a home for seven days. It has a begin date, it has an end date. The consumer has to sign it, you have to sign it. It is not brokerage specific according to this document. It's just for Zillow for those agents that work with Zillow. I can tell you that you might be able to get away with using it temporarily. You will not be able to use it moving forward once House Bill 466 passes the Senate. It's already passed the House. It will pass the Senate. And that's because Ohio law will go into place that says that you must have a written buyer agency agreement. So a touring agreement doesn't work, right? So I just, I, I say that to you because you're going to hear different things on the internet and different states have different rules that will not fly in Ohio. So if you are even thinking about using that document or say, hey, Rich, why don't we just do a touring document? It's not going to be very long that it's going to be in place. Okay, so that's the answer for that. Um, let's go ahead, unless there's anything super pressing that anybody has to share or thoughts, we'll go ahead and jump into this document. Again, it's a temporary document for the most part because we will be either using, but use this for now. It's in dot loop, use it. Uh, as much as you can get familiar with it because I cannot promise you that we will absolutely do our own. I do not know what we're going to decide yet. Uh, that's why I'm soliciting your feedback. Okay. Has anybody used the form so far and felt comfortable using? Okay. So decent, decent group. Okay. Good. All right. Let's go ahead. Hopefully I can All right, let's go all the way up. All right, so this is an Ohio Realtors form. It is copyrighted, so we can't change it. So that's the only thing that you have to remember is on this document, when you're working with a consumer, you must, when we get to the bottom, put in that 295 additional commission on top of whatever else commission that you are thinking about working with the consumer. We've not set a minimum commission. I talked to you at team meeting. It sounds like most of the agents do not want a minimum commission enforced, but we want it on the form, right? That was kind of our thought. How many of us think that $3,500 is still a fair amount as a minimum commission for any property? Again, just for the consumer to see it. You could have the capability of reducing it because we wouldn't enforce that, but do we think 3,500 is too little, too much? Any thoughts? All right, so it's not broke, let's not fix it. So 3,500, okay. Zoom, you folks are super quiet. All right. All right, let's see the chats. Yeah, well, it's at the top, but for some reason this, uh, that'll show up on the screen. All right. So if we don't enforce it, it's kind of pointless and offers the agent puts it. I don't disagree. I mean, I think that if we're going to have a minimum, we could enforce it, but we we can figure that out. Uh, so I did repeat the question. You guys couldn't hear me on Zoom. Buyers might want to know prior to seeing a home if they can afford the commission. They're certainly going to want to know if they can afford the commission before they purchase. Um, what's that? They'll still ask. They will still ask to see it. There's no question. Yet. They will still ask to see it. <laughs> well, this is going to stop probably agents from showing houses that are over budget for consumers. They're going to say, I'm not going to go show you a $300,000 house when you can only afford a $200,000 house, right? Because why are you going to waste your time when you're not getting paid? So, all right. Okay, so good, 3,500. Everybody's good, 3,500. Okay. Would this include rentals? Uh, Kelly Starr is asking on Zoom. Uh, no, it would not include rentals because it would be very difficult when rent could only be maybe $600 on a property and we'd charge $3,500. That's a great business model. Sign me up for that one. Uh, I would not have you being my property uh, person anymore, Kelly, if that's the case. So don't, don't do that. Uh, but yes, uh, I would say we'll figure out on the rental side of it. But for listings and purchase, $3,500 is what we'll put in the document. Okay. Sorry, I've never done this two screens before. It's really different though. All right. So anyway, the first paragraph, uh, they had tweaked this a little bit. In my last class, I had told you that the buyer's name goes, and I actually had a spot right here and here for that. 
unfortunately, that is not the case. We're not putting the buyer's name there, but the brokerage name does go in that first line. Uh, and if you look in dot loop, it's already pre-typed in. And in dot loop, I did have, I did put buyer's name right next to line three. So if you want to fill those in, you can. Because like I said, the important part is to know who the buyer is that you're actually working with, not the father of the brother or sister that's buying the house. So uh, the brokerage name goes in that first line. All right. And then. Oh, I thought, well, I just had to, I just pulled it in from. Dot loop. Uh, yeah. And it's not pre-filled in, but I went to. The, the Keller Williams part should be okay. on line one. Yeah, if you go in our dot loop and you go under our buyer information, line one should already have the brokerage name in it. So you should be, not that you can't fill it out, but it should be in the book. And then, like I said, on line three, you can add the buyer's names if you want to. If there's one or two, uh, there is a spot on there to do that. All right, and then the purpose of the agreement. So I have seen agents just put one address on this on line seven or six. And I would tell you, you're never going to just put one address because you will have to start filling out this agreement before you even show a property to a consumer. So I envision you meeting with a client, not necessarily at the first house they want to see, but in your office or someplace outside the office that you're actually having a consultation with this buyer. So they're not calling you today at three o'clock saying, I went in a house at six o'clock tonight. It's going to take a while for consumers to figure out that they have to sign something with you, uh, We'll try and have some literature around that and good information as a brokerage so that you can share that. Nope. <laughs> that's all right. And, uh, oh, yep, that's fine. Just mute me. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. All right. Uh, but anyway, I say property located in Ohio or in the county or municipality that you're working in. It's interesting. I saw online over the weekend, there was an agent complaining about driving to Columbus to show a house now because the commission was at 1% on the listing side of it. And I thought, why are you driving to Columbus to show a house anyway, right? <laughs> if you are from the Akron, Cleveland area, you probably know nothing about, but agents are desperate right now, right? We are all clinging to any form of life that is buying or selling a house at the particular moment. So I can see why agents are doing it. I do not recommend that you do it. But you need to be very either vague or specific about the area in which you intend to work with this consumer. Because if you put Summit County or Stark County or whatever, they might find another agent to work with them in Wayne County or Tuscarawas County. If your exclusive buyer agency agreement says you're only working with them with that particular area, why wouldn't they work with a different agent in a different area? You can say Northeast Ohio, but define Northeast Ohio for me. If you go like on the news, they have the map for Northeast Ohio. So we're going to say it's it's Fox 8's map of Northeast Ohio. That's what we're going to use. Hey, Rich. So if you're going to say in the state of Ohio, that's why I said you could put property located in Ohio or property located in Stark County or property located in Jackson Township. Whatever, but but don't miss that's my point. That's my point. Don't miss. Hey, Rich, this is Charlie. What about? Oh, hang on uh, one second. There's somebody on Zoom talking to. That's hey, Rich. Hey, Rich. How you doing? This is Charlie. Charlie Ford. Hey, Charles. Resid what about residential property? You could put residential property, but the residential property, I mean, it has to be in the state of Ohio simply because your license is only good in Ohio. So you could put residential property. I don't know. I, I think I'd want to be a little bit more specific than residential property. I would okay. say something like, because it, it, I think it already states in here that you have, it's it's not specific to residential. So okay. I would just say property located in Ohio, but you could say residential. Okay. Yep. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. He had a question. Like specific areas for me, as an agent for this transaction, and if we're going outside of that, it would be a Keller Williams group to another Keller. Agent. But you're not going to be able to control that, but you could try. Yeah, the question is, could you refer business out to another county or another part of the state? And of course, you always have been able to, but you're not going to be able to necessarily control that with the consumer. So I, in my opinion, like I said, I would put in the state of Ohio, property located in the state of Ohio or in the counties that you're going to work exclusively. What about the 
Something for the one Shonda, hang on. Shonda had her hand up. No. Is your name Shonda? I mean, I didn't know we had two Shondas in the room. All right. Go ahead. Uh, so, for example, I have a buyer right now, and I have a buyer agency with him for a certain area. Well, I also know that he decided to be buying in this area or in Cleveland, and he has contacted an agent here. So, what I'm actually doing is suggesting or just saying you should have a buyer agency with your chosen realtor up there yep. and me for down here for wherever you decide to purchase. And that's the way I live yeah, so for Shonda's point, and that's why I say to you, I mean, this is a consultation with you and your buyer. This is not a, let me just write something on here and see what sticks. It's a consultation like you would be going on a listing appointment with the consumer, with your buyer. So if I know, and it's happened, and if it hasn't happened in your career yet, it will. There will be somebody that says, I'm relocating to Ohio. I'm looking at Cleveland, Canton, and Columbus, or whatever the three areas are. I do not want to work with them for Cincinnati or Columbus or Cleveland. So I am going to put on this form property in Stark, Summit, Portage, Carroll, what, whatever area they're looking in here. And I'm going to say to them, I think you should find an agent up north, which I'm happy to refer you to another Keller Williams agent up there. And that's the agent you should work for Cuyahoga County or any of those other counties. Uh, it will happen. And that's why I'm saying to you, I would say have a consultation with them and put in here what matters to them and you that you've had a conversation about. Lynette? Like it's a number one purpose. Like we're going to have a conversation about the purpose. The purpose of the agreement is to establish an exclusive agency relationship between the buyer and the agent. Why do I, I guess I'm still not convinced that why I need to fill in, like right now on my buyer agency, I say Northeast Ohio property. Sometimes I'll say residential, but sometimes they're also business I mean, it says, and as set forth below, I suppose you could not fill that out, but. Because it's an expect. So the question is that Lynette's asking is why would I limit myself in section? Well, on line four through 10, why would I limit myself? And the only thing that I can think of, to be quite honest with you, is again, it's your area of expertise. It's going to be limited depending upon the agent that you're working with. And this is about transparency with the buyer. Your license is good for all of Ohio. But if I have a client that comes to me and says, I want to live in Cincinnati, Dayton, or Columbus, or Canton, I need to have a very transparent conversation with them. I don't have access to the Dayton and Cincinnati marketplace. I might have access to Columbus. I will not be your resource. Do not think of me as your resource for those areas because I can't help you. So it's a conversation. So that's the only reason that I can say you would limit yourself is because you're limiting your area of expertise, which is unless you have the whole state sewn up, uh, most agents don't. And it's the consumer that understands the transparency. Oh, I only have you in this area. That's what I would say. We even have the communication like one that can take back the expectations, but set boundaries and yep. education. Because they do come in with a lot of questions. There's and a lot of questions are being asked. Yep. They're filled in so quickly. You can have an opportunity to do things with a one on one. Yeah. Instead of saying, Well, where I want to go, and how before you fill out, so you're having that. Yeah, I mean, I just had a lady that said she wanted a specific area in a county, and I've only been sending her those. And all of a sudden, she says to me, no, no, the whole county. She doesn't want to buy in the whole county, but she wants to know what's available in the whole county. She wants to be in a particular area. So it's like, I would put that county in here then because I know she's going to be buying in that county. I wouldn't limit myself to just the city that she was talking about or school district. But if she said to me, and this person is moving from Northwest Ohio, I'm not your guy. Quite simply, I'm not that person. So don't come to me and expect me to be sending you homes from me. So that's why I would say it's a great opportunity for you to educate yourself, but also the, the consumer. Linda has a question or a comment. Yeah. So the only time you're speaking to the board, 
the very cause of boredom was because I had uh, a, the chain. I, yep. I, I could sleep for 30 times. Um, but also, afterwards, the, the panel told me uh, one of the big things that slowed down, one of the other big things that slowed down the bone of boredom, which was missing, was because I had a buyer's agreement and it was pretty specific. Yeah. A buyer's agency agreement is definitely going to start coming into play with procuring cause or just any kind of conversations with buyers. Um, that's why I say you could put Ohio, but it just doesn't do you much good. So Linda was just sharing a time where she was at the board for procuring cause and um, she won because she was very specific on and had a buyer agency agreement signed. So let's see, Rich, is there a direction yet on what to do if buyers sign multiple exclusive buyer agency forms? No, that's that's the problem, Stephanie. Uh, you're asking the question is, it's going to happen. Buyers are going to sign more than one. And that's why I'm saying on our form, my thought on this is to ask the question, Are have you seen any property with any other realtor in the last 30 days? So let's ask that question first, because to Scott's point, do they understand what working with a realtor means? The definition will be there, but let's just simplify it. Have you looked at any real estate in the last 30 days with any other agent? And then the other thing would be, have you signed an exclusive buyer agency agreement or a non-exclusive buyer agency agreement with any other brokerage? Because there are going to be brokerages that absolutely say it's non-exclusive. You can go sign as many of these as you want. That's why I'm questioning. I don't want to have a non-exclusive, but there will be brokerages that that do want that and they will. So. Is there a scenario where, to your point, I just want to sell properties in, let's say, start in summer. Mm -hmm. Client is also looking in Cuyahoga and Portage yep. County or whatever. I'm meeting with the client. I'm selling myself as an agent, but I'm also probably need to do a little good job of selling Keller Williams. As a broker, if I've got a partner in those other two places, a partner agent, mm -hmm. could the agreement be that I will show you properties in these counties. This this agent will show you properties in these counties, and then you work it out so that wherever they purchase, I'm getting the name, I'm getting the referral, whatever. So the question for those of you on Zoom is if I am working in Stark and Summit County, for example, but yet there's another agent that this client wants to look in Portage County and Cuyahoga County, can we say, well, you're going to work with me during this period, but those counties you're going to work with another agent. The problem is Keller Williams as a brokerage, it, we are a franchise. We cannot control what a consumer does at any other Keller Williams franchise or brokerage. The same is true whether it's our sister companies at Elevate or Living. This brokerage is not identified as Keller Williams to the division of real estate. It is identified as Legacy Group Realty. Those are identified as Elevate and Living or whatever else they have up there. And so therefore, you cannot commit a consumer to another brokerage through this one. But you're not going to offer them something to sign on our agreement that says that they're going to work with another Keller Williams agent in a different area under a different brokerage. It's a brokerage agreement specific to that brokerage. And we don't, we have no idea. Like I said, this is not a standard form. I don't know what those brokerages are going to do differently than ours or any other brokerage. So you can't ask the consumer to sign that. So no, they can't promise you. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little bit about 11 through 13, the term of the agreement. My suggestion is I would not go longer than three to six months. In this market, I could see you doing six months. In a market where there's a flood of homes, you might do three months. I would not say doing a year is smart. And I say that simply because I've seen agents get documents signed for a year. Consumers will sign almost anything you put in front of them for the most part if they trust you. Well, it's not a problem until it's a problem. And then it becomes a problem and they want out of it. Now, if they email you and we leave it at that and they can get out of it, great. They owe you nothing. That's fine. But I don't think that signing for one year is a good idea for anybody. If I were a consumer, I don't want to sign with a year for you. If I'm happy with you, I'll sign six months and I'll sign again in six months. That's my philosophy. I don't know how you guys feel about that. You can put anything you want in here, but I really say I would not go past six months. I would three months because it's a good gauge of that buyer's worries right now. Sure. Three months, look at the buyer's you can get in a contract bag. It's not as an extension. I kind of just sit back. Yeah. If 
Right. And three months is fine. Like I said, this yeah. is this is going to be up to you as an agent individual. I'm not telling you you have to do six months, a year, three months. I'm just saying I wouldn't do a year if it were me. I know some agents will. But yes, if I, if I have a consumer that says, well, I'm not really not in a hurry and I'm looking for a very specific property, I might tie them up longer, right? Oh, yes. Let's do a 30-year listing. Yeah, well, that was outlawed. That was outlawed in Florida, and it's not coming to Ohio because we're already aware. So we're laughing about this. Uh, there was a company down in Florida that was doing a 30-year listing agreement, and the consumer, whether you lived in the house by the time it sold or not, if your family inherited it, it didn't matter. That company was paying you like between five hundred and a thousand dollars to sign the agreement or whatever you could negotiate. It went against your deed or whatever, and then. 30 years, if you were in that window, that house must be sold with that brokerage, right? And so that was, so that's what we're laughing about in here. That's what they're saying. So it's, it's been outlawed just so you know, no, I was well aware, but it's not going to happen here either. So, all right. Uh, so that's the time frame. So then the duties and services of the agent, really, it just says that, you know, you're going to agree to your professional skill. So that, again, that says, don't go outside your service area that you know, because that's your professional skill is to not go to Cincinnati to go show 15 houses and stay in a hotel halfway in between just for a commission. Um, and that you're going to follow the Realtor Code of Ethics. Something that you can start standing on that most consumers don't know is they think that the word realtor is interchangeable with real estate agent. It's not. Realtor is a professional designation. It's a registered trademark. It has the, the registered trademark symbol after it. It's there because we are held by the standards of ethics and the... Um, the NAR codes and canons of ethics. Real estate agents are not. Most commercial agents are not realtors. They are only real estate agents. And I say that they have the same license we hold. They just don't pay to be belong to these. And they don't have the services for procuring cause or the ethics for to file a complaint against another person. They have to go directly to the division of real estate. That's it. So you, you can start standing on that merit too. What you do as a real estate professional or a realtor matters. Um, and I think you should definitely go to nar.realtor and look up all of the wonderful things that not only you do for the consumer as fellow realtors, but that NAR has done. Uh, one of the things somebody said to me, what has NAR done for me? It's like, um, ha how many of you have ever gone to Canada or sold a house in Canada or know anything about Canadian real estate? Right. Most of us. Do you know that they do not have a 30 year fixed mortgage? Do you know that their mortgages adjust every few years and you can't get a fixed mortgage for longer than three to five years? Guess who did the 30 year fixed mortgage? All of your people that came before you as realtors. Like we are a huge lobbying organization. There's a lot of things that you do for the consumer that your dues pay for that you may not realize. But I would start standing on it because it's going to give you some validity as a real estate professional against other people that are not and have no idea what's going on. All right. Then the duties of the buyer. This is where I think, like I said, I would change a few things and I would have the buyers initial that they're not working with another company, that they understand this is an exclusive agreement and that they haven't looked at any other real property with any. Uh, I think the question in here was, uh, this is co uh, for commercial property as well. As of the moment, it's going to be for any buyer that I'm aware of unless House Bill 466 is amended. Uh, to not include commercial real estate, it's going to be to show any property. It doesn't say residential specifically that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. So again, it just it just says what the duties of the buyer are. It's really just a matter of being loyal to you. That's really all it's coming down to. And then the compensation. So there's a few different ways you can fill this out. I don't really care how you fill it out, but you need to understand your best practice and the way that you want to fill it out. So compensation, you could say the buyer shall pay the brokerage a flat fee of two ninety five dollars because we know that that is our minimum commission that we will charge in addition to whatever the other commission is, and plus blank percent of the purchase price. Now, you could say, I'm not going to fill out the first section. I'm not going to put a flat fee of two ninety five dollars because it says if it's left blank, it's not applicable. You might say, I'm going to include that two ninety five. dollars in whatever the percentage is on the right-hand side. So you might say, I'm going to only charge 3% 
And you have to understand as a Keller Williams legacy group agent, out of that 3%, if you don't procure the additional 295, what's going to happen? The 295 is going to come out of your 3% or $100 is going to come out of your 3% depending upon which commission split you're on. So that means when you go to fill out a command commission request, you have to figure out what am I doing? Do I have the 295 added in there or do I not? Do I need to make a note to Cassandra, right? So I personally filled it out this way. It says it's a flat 295 because I want them to understand there's an additional commission fee of 295 going to the brokerage plus whatever other commission that I'm procuring through the transaction. Again, you can do it whatever way you want, but just make sure that if you leave that blank, the 295 is coming out of your commission. Everybody understand that? Okay. All right. And then the 3% that I put in there, that again is 100% negotiable, just like, just like it's always been. The key takeaways here are what we're probably going to be changing about this form or Ohio may change it if we, if we stick with this one is you cannot get paid more money than what you put in. Okay. So if you put 295 in that first box and you put 1% in the right-hand side box, that's all you are legally allowed to collect no matter who it comes from. So if you go show 15 houses and the, you just get lucky and the one house that you write on is paying three and a half percent commission, guess what? You're only collecting 1% because that's what you negotiated with your consumer and you put in there. Don't ask me what happens to the other two and a half percent because I have no idea. I don't know if the seller gets to keep it. I don't know if the listing agent somehow gets to keep it. I doubt, but I have no idea what happens to that commission. I can't, I cannot answer that, but I can say to you, whatever you put in here, that is what you're getting paid. So don't be the hero that says, oh, don't worry, work with me. I'm going to work off the lowest profit margin available, and I'm only going to charge you a flat $2,500, no matter how long I work with you or how many houses we see. You're going to end up bankrupt. Scott, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Scott had his hand up first. Go ahead. Go Yep. Yep. We have at times um, put that on our customer rotation. Yeah. We put something on the contract that says that they have a fair amount of you know, that's a great question. So Scott was asking, so those of you that haven't been in the business very long, or I will say from 2015 forward, you have no idea what a foreclosure sale looks like, short sales look like, auctions look like. Um, and so Scott's asking the question, well, if I go on hubzoo.com or auction.com, a lot of times I, as the agent, am charged $200 for their technology fee. And I have to pay that. It comes out of the commission that they're willing to pay. So the question is, can we put something on here that says the consumer is going to actually be picking that up? I can ask that question today when I meet with Cindy. I don't know the answer to that. I would imagine that there could be something on there that any fees that are incurred as part of your offer could be paid for by the consumer. Excuse me. Sure, we can ask that question. Uh, oh, sorry. He, you, no, I'm good. You're good. Okay. Okay. And then you had a question. Uh, I was just asking, so when you start work around, let's just say you're working with somebody you know and you want to offer like a little lower commission than you normally do, or you just want to take whatever the sellers You offering. cannot just do that. You cannot. So there is this is not allowed to be an open ended agreement. You can't say, I'll just take whatever the seller is offering. Whatever you put in here is what you're getting. So that's so. What we're going to word it as, or my suggestion is to word it, and even with the state document, hopefully this will get changed, and that's why we're on the fence of whether we're using this one or our own. You are absolutely allowed to say that, for example, on this one, plus 3% of the purchase price, less any commission paid by the seller. We can absolutely say that, but you can't say, I will just take any commission that's offered by the seller. Then the next question is always, well, can I just take less than? Can I just take what the seller offers and not charge the full 3%? My only answer to that is I, I would say don't do that simply because if you start offering certain people for whatever reason, 
lesser commission than what you negotiated here, first of all, you're going to devalue your services moving forward. But secondly, I could see that friend telling another friend, hey, with me, he reduced the commission to X and I didn't have to pay him anything. But you don't know this next friend as well as you know the other friend and you want to charge them more. You're going to get yourself into trouble. Like it's going to come back. Anytime you make special deals with people, you will always find yourself getting in trouble. Always. That's one of the reasons I love, many reasons, but one of the reasons I love, we are all on the same cap, right? There's nobody that has a lesser cap. I don't offer somebody something less because you're brand new to this brokerage versus somebody that's been here for a while. Special deals will always catch up to you. That's that's a problem. So I would say don't do it. Uh, let's see here. Is there any questions? Have it automatically renew after six months unless consumer opts out. You know, Ben, that's a great question. I don't know if we can automatically renew. We'll have to ask and, and find out. I don't know that I would want it to automatically renew because if I've worked with somebody for six months, either they're not motivated or I'm not motivated as their agent, one of the two. Uh, and I can see, I mean, think about how many subscriptions you subscribe to and forget about them because they're on auto renew. And then you're angry because you just paid $8.99 for something for four months that you forgot about. And they're happy because they got the money. I don't know that I would want to do that to a consumer personally. I, I don't I don't mind the question, but I don't know if that's a great, great opportunity. Uh, do we know yet if we are allowed to do an addendum to alter that commission? We do not. So Jessica on Zoom is asking the question about altering that. So again, according to this document, if you wanted to make an amendment to it, it sounds like all you'd have to do is send an email to cancel the exclusive buyer agency agreement or the, the buyer would. And then could you just write another? One? Well, my questions to you are on that are if you're doing the listing agreements right, which I will just tell you 80 percent of you are not. Um, if you're doing the listing agreements right when it comes to withdrawing with release or without release, the dates up here matter. And if you try and enter into another buyer agency agreement when you've already got these dates. Once you've canceled one, I'm wondering who's going to want the paperwork to verify that you canceled one and then did another one. Are we as the brokerage going to have to start monitoring that? I don't know. We don't know the answer to that yet. And I hate to say that because I'd love to have all the answers for you, but nobody has all the answers right now. We just don't. Um, I can't imagine why you would want to do an addendum to reduce the commission though, unless you can't get a deal together for some reason. And we've seen that where, you know, maybe you're going to help pay for a rate on or something like that. I can see that happening, but that's an inducement to a sale. And that means it has to be on an addendum. Even right now, you have to write an addendum that says you're inducing somebody into moving forward by paying for something out of your commission or you paying for something. So that already should be happening. So I don't think it would have anything to do with the buyer agency. That's just my opinion. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah, the technology fee on like HubZoo and things like that. Well, if you know that you're going to use it, but how many times do you know that you're going to go show a HubZoo house the buyer is going to buy it? You don't know that. I mean, most likely if it's an investor, they're going to be looking at multiple properties, right? And so you don't know that that specific auction.com house versus the Fannie Mae house is they're going to write on. So I don't think you can necessarily add the $200 additional fee in there. But we could, as a blanket, say, if we work with any of these companies and there's a technology fee, the buyer is also responsible for paying. Yeah. So we, we could do something like that. Yep. All right. And then the total compensation shall not be less than, I put $5,000 in there. It depends on the price of the property, but it also says not applicable if left blank. And so you have to decide if you want a minimum. Diana, do you have a question? I do. If you go back up to my understanding, you have 30 days. So we know there's some transactions. Oh, I'm sorry. I did skip that part. Yep. So you go under contract and something happens and things get extended. Mm -hmm. So if it goes past that 30 days, then they don't owe you the commission? Are we allowed to adjust that? Or do we want to go 60 days to make sure? Yeah, so the question is... Things happen and get delayed. <laughs> Nothing gets delayed in real estate, Diana. Come on now. Uh, that's, no, all right. And I apologize. I skipped that. So I'm glad you brought it to my attention. Yeah, so lines 32 and 33... 
the buyer's purchase or acquisition occurs 30 calendar days after the end of the stated term of the agreement, the buyer became aware of the purchaser acquired real property during the stated term of this agreement. It's a mouthful, but basically, if they are closing 30 days after the end of my agreement, am I still going to be paid? Uh, that's a great question. Would we have to go back in and amend that to say maybe 60 days? So maybe 30 days is really just not even the what we need to put in here. Maybe it should be a 60 day window because of delays. So that's something that's great. Now, I don't know that a, I would imagine there are buyers out there that are savvy enough or I'll say the word savvy just because it's nicer. But I mean, that would say, oh, I'm outside of my 30 day window. I don't have to pay you. anything." So that's a great point. Oh, yeah. So 60 days is probably 45 to 60 days. Well, 60 days is probably the minimum you might want to put in there because 45, it could still be within a closing. And I would say this, you could get another one signed when you know that this is going to be up. This is going to make you as an agent pay attention to say, oh, that's right, on 716, my buyer agency agreement is up. I need to get a new one signed. It's just the same as a listing agreement. Instead of letting it go pending expired, you extend the listing agreement before it expires. Why does what have to be in there? So I think the reason that this would be in here is because, again, this being relatively new, if you go and buy a property for sale by owner, while this is still valid or within 30 days of this being valid, I may not have sold you the property, but you still owe me a commission. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's is what that's, I, yeah. That's, that's the only reason I can think that it would be in, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Ben is asking a question on online here. Can we add a line that states the minimum commission we will accept up to X amount? So you can't leave it open-ended. Up to X amount will be open-ended. It has to be a very specific percent or number. And But that is there. That is the opportunity. You have that box that says on line 34, total compensation shall not be less than $5,000 or whatever it is that you want to put in it. But again, if it's left blank, it's not applicable anyway. Um, I would hesitate. I can see this two ways. If I'm working with a $400,000 buyer or a $200,000 buyer or whatever, I would not really want to put in not less than blank personally. Well, I would leave it blank. I, I would intentionally leave it blank because when I start negotiating with the consumer and they say, oh yeah, that's no problem. I'll pay you 3% or I'll pay you 2.5%, whatever it is. Great. Of the purchase price of the house. And we get into a tough negotiation and I have in here that I would take less, they're going to remind me of that and say, well, you know, you said you would take, you would actually work with me for $5,000 instead of the two and a half percent. So why don't you rebate me some of that commission back? Or why don't we amend this agreement so you don't owe me, so I don't owe you that commission? I can absolutely see buyers doing that. So this is a negotiation against yourself. I mean, Jose will always say too, he doesn't like to negotiate against himself. And I'm going to tell you the same thing. Don't. Well, why is it in there? Well, because you might be working with somebody that is maybe looking at a $50,000 property, 50 to 100, and I might say, the minimum I'm willing to work for is this, right? And so I, I'm going to say, yeah, I'll do it for 2.5%, but the minimum I'm going to work for is this because of the price of the house that you're, you're looking at. So that's why it would be in there. So if you know the price of the house is more than $100,000, you may not need to put anything in there. Right. You could just leave it blank. But that but I definitely see it being there for a reason. I don't know that we're going to get back to seeing 10 and 15 and 20 thousand dollar houses uh, or 50 thousand dollar houses, but we might. So. So I have someone who did get an investor who buys multiple properties, but then there's also times where they are now working on their personal property. And so then this only to these properties if it's not. Like, well, not you might. Then my minimum is two thousand dollars, mm -hmm. but now you're going to buy a personal property. Well, if it's a five hundred thousand dollar home, do you see what I'm saying? I do see what you're saying, and that's a good question. And so I'll share with people on Zoom as well. So Lynette, 
mind, Lynette always has these ones for me. She, she's always making me think. So her thought was, well, if I'm working with an investor that says I'm only, you know, maybe they're buying 50 to $100,000 houses, but they're going to end up maybe selling or I'm sorry, not selling, but buying a $500,000 home for themselves. That's why having the consultation, in my opinion, is important because right here is where I would say any investment property or other than your primary residence in the state of Ohio. And if I were working with that consumer to buy their prop, their primary residence, I would put in here a separate agreement that says for your primary residence. But, so that would be two different well, buyer agreements with the same person. I don't see why you couldn't. They've not told us you can't have more than one buyer agency agreement. Uh, because it distinguishes the difference, the more specific you are about what you're searching for. Or you would just put it in there. You would just say the agreement, this agreement is exempt for your primary residence. Something like that. So that would be, that would be my suggestion. I know lots of size over here. Some size. All right. And then I think the biggest uh, thing that you want to make sure that you're aware of is on line 39 through 41 is we're going to check box one pretty much always hopefully that the buyer does consent to an agent accepting compensation from more than one party. And the reason that we want to make sure of that is because if the buyer can't afford to pay you all of the money, that the seller is allowed to pay you or the listing brokerage is allowed to pay you. If, if you check the second box does not consent, you're only getting payment from one party. You better figure out who that is. It's going to be the buyer. Surprise. Because the listing, the listing company can't pay you or you can't make more than what is allowed and the buyer is going to be responsible for paying all of it. So I can't, I, I think we have defaulted in dot loop to that, but double check uh, as you're going through. And then, like I said, termination, it's really just termination is emailing one or the other to say that you want out of the agreement. Do we know how that's going to look? We've already talked about that. So I don't want to belabor that anymore. Uh, could it look different? Sure. It could. We'll find out. Uh, consent uh, to delegation. So basically, if you are going on vacation or you are doing something, so to your point, uh, asking the question about like, if I'm going on vacation or working with another agent in my brokerage, as long as the buyer is okay with it, you are allowed to have that consumer work with another person in your brokerage. Now, what I will say is, if you do that, remember on the agency disclosure form, you're going to have to add that agent in because that agent now has personal or probably will have personal information about your consumer. So if you're going on vacation, you might want to write the agent's name in here, but you will definitely want to add that agent to the, the property disclosure form. Right? And then the consent to disclose, a buyer consents to the agent disclosing to the seller or seller's agent information regarding uh, the buyers, including buyer's identity. We've had people before that say, I don't want my identity given to the seller. I don't want them to know that I'm buying the property. Uh, and we're identifying here that you can. Uh, buyers consent to prior job history, credit income sources of funds, or any other information normally used. How many times have you been asked by a listing agent about a buyer's personal information for lending purposes and you've answered without even asking your buyer? Nobody would raise their hand and do that. Uh, but I'm sure that you have if you've given, you've never been asked anything about somebody's financing. How about how about relocation? Yeah, relocation. Well, the pre-approval is one thing. I mean, I've asked about pre-approval, but I've had agents ask me, especially if you're writing a deal on a property where they have to sell their home first, what their financing looks like, it's contingent upon that and basically what their down payment is. We're putting that out there on the purchase agreement. So we're giving, not always on the pre-approval. I mean, their down payment could be, it is depends on the bank, but yeah, it depends. But it's just saying you, you have the right to give that information, and I think that buyers, if they read this, might have questions to you. Why would you share that information? Why would you share my credit score? Chances are, I don't know your credit score. <laughs> so, right, but it's on here. All right, and then um, so any information normally used by by a lender, but I know that we've all been in a situation where a buyer loses their job in a transaction, and we're going to share that in order to get the, hopefully their earnest money back, right? Well, this is giving information that you can give to the consumer or to the listing agent. So just consent to disclose. And then professional advice and assistance. Uh, we are not home inspectors. We don't know anything about 
hazardous materials or environmental conditions or warranties and all that stuff. This limits our scope of opening us up to liability because it's very specific to real estate. Oftentimes buyers or sellers think that we know everything about everything and we don't. But this also is a reminder for you that when you're in a home inspection, keep your mouth shut because you probably don't know as much as you think that you do. Let the inspectors do their work, right? And then uh, dispute resolution. So this does say that, you know, if for some reason there is a dispute, which I imagine would be payment, right? For this particular, this would be whether or not you want payment. Um, and that means that we would go through mediation, which is correct because we would want to go through mediation lawfully before you are sued or we sue the consumer. Uh, and it just says that it will have to be, I think it's in the county in which, uh, yeah, recommended to be a retired judge or justice or attorney of at least five years uh, for residential real estate experience unless the parties mutually agree to a different mediator. So, and then as far as paying for it, typically it would be split between the buyer and us in order to pay for this mediation. So I would say to you, just remember that because the brokerage is gonna limit what they're going to spend on this mediation. You as the agent may end up paying part of the mediation if necessary. And I won't guarantee that, but I, it, it's probably not beyond a question that we might get into. So, all right. And then um, property condition. So it indemnifies us again that, you know, we don't know what the property condition is. A lot of times uh, after you sell a house to a buyer, they might say, you should have known the basement gets wet or you knew that this happened or whatever. You didn't know, you know, you didn't know the hot water tank was going to go out on Sunday morning at two o'clock when they, you know, just moved in or whatever. So it just, again, limits us. And I will tell you, uh, Michigan has used this document or a document like this for many years now. And it has stayed off a lot of lawsuits against the brokerages because simply this document gets sent to the attorney of the buyer or the seller and says, listen, we identified our scope and our limits of what our professionalism extends to, and we're indemnified from the others. Okay, so it does help you. So this is on your side. Any additional provisions? Um, I don't know what we would put as additional provisions. I think I've spoken to a few of you uh, sporadically and there's been a few things come up, but really I, I don't know what you would put in as an additional provision. Unless you can think of anything and you share it with a group, I'm happy to share that. Yep. So the Seller is already offering a three percent commission. That verbiage, like to let the buyers know, like you're not, you don't owe me another three percent until I get to come to the seller. That is going to be next to that paragraph, or would we? Well, my my vision would be to have. So the question is for those of you on Zoom is so like under additional provisions, could you temporarily until we figure out whether we're using this document or another one, write in there that. The commission, the 3% that's owed, the buyer will owe 3% commission less any commissions paid for by the seller. You could write that in, but remember, if you go to the top up here on page two, it's it already says, whoops, whoops, too far. It already says that you're consenting, the buyer's consenting to in the agent accepting compensation from more than one party. And so really, if the seller is offering some type of compensation, the buyer is only paying 3% total. You're not getting it twice. So I don't know that you would need to add that in here personally. Like, mm -hmm. About that, like, so would you get paid on both? No, you won't get paid because you can't get paid more than what's on this document. And so you can't get paid 2% or 3% from the seller and another 3% from the buyer. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so that would be, so that would clear that up. But if you guys think of anything, like I said, share it with me, let me know. Uh, as I teach these classes, I'd love to know. And then, then this is the entire agreement. There's nothing else outside of this. There's no documents uh, aside from this. This is the, the whole thing. And then the, the statement for fair housing, which is in our listing agreement or purchase agreement, it is the same in everybody's purchase agreement. Listing agreement it is from the uh, federal fair housing. Uh, we must include that. And then it just says, again, that wire fraud, you know, never respond to anything as far as social security numbers, credit cards, and anything like that. Um, don't ever provide wire information. You shouldn't shouldn't be doing that. And then each person signs and dates it here at the bottom. So it's 
relatively easy, even though it's three pages, it really does cover an awful lot of information. Um, let's see, I don't know, do I have more questions here? Give me a second here, I'm gonna go back to the chat form here. All right, so if seller, if seller has a buyer contact before listing, I oh, know she says, sorry, not for this form. Okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> All right, Melissa Steyer says, I think 60 days, uh, at least not 30. And I agree, Diane, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's great. Uh, 30 days, I would just, like I said, envision you're either gonna need to start writing in 60 days there and know the dates of these, but I would also say, I would not wait for it to expire. I would treat it like a listing agreement and I would get another one signed knowing that this is going to expire. Uh, we don't have an amendment yet. It's not like we have a, an addendum to the listing agreement, so it's not as easy. Um, we might have an addendum to this, but we don't have one yet. So I would say, if you know it's expiring on 617 and 617 is approaching, I'd be getting with my consumer to get another one signed for 618 forward for another three months or six months. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. August 17th is the date that we're required to start using this form prior to showing and it's recommended use. It is recommended to use now, Stephanie. Yes. Um, the 17th is really about the MLS commission coming out. That's when the, the commission you will no longer see published. Um, the buyer agency could happen before that because of House Bill 466. What's that, Scott? Yeah, because of the state level. So it, it's very possible that that's actually going to come out beforehand. That's why we're trying to work on this now and, and get information. Uh, Sandy says, so when we put two and a half percent and you say we cannot get any more than that and they check consent, that means that we can get that three percent of the seller maybe pay. That's correct. So you cannot. If you put two and a half percent on this document and the seller is offering three percent or even two percent, you cannot get more than what you have on this document. Again, the question then goes back to, how do we amend this document? Can it be amended? Can we cancel this agreement and write up a new one? I don't know the answer to that question yet. I can just tell you that whatever you put on this form is what you should be anticipating being paid. Okay. Uh, is it okay to have a buyer initial the date extension? I don't see why you couldn't have the buyer initial the date extension, but I think it would be better to have another one of these forms done as the extension. It's just like a listing agreement or the purchase agreement. We do an addendum to it. We don't typically go back and change the listing agreement or the purchase agreement. We use an addendum to change it. So I would, we don't have an addendum for this yet. So I still think that you would just get a new one signed altogether unless we come up with an addendum, which we don't have. Uh, let's see, that seems, oh, that's the reason I'm wondering if we can alter it. Uh, you cannot, I, I'm not sure, Jessica, what you mean by that's the reason I'm wondering if we can alter it. So you, is my understanding you cannot alter this document, first of all, because it's copyright. So you we cannot change this document in any form. You can't download it and change the verbiage. It's copyright. Um, again, I go back to altering anything on this document, even if it's in a box, you should probably go ahead and cancel the agreement with the consumer and write up a new one because it's gonna be very confusing or could be, I should say, Confusing for a buyer that says, no, I didn't I didn't really want to extend this date. I know I initialed it, but that was back whenever. So I, I think just getting a new one signed would be. Uh, opinion on wording to say a client that has signed an agreement with someone else and wants to get toward me. Yes, so we would just hopefully get that part initialed that says that you haven't signed another agreement with another agent and you haven't looked at property in the last 30 days. That I think they should initial next to. And then Jessica says, if we put two and a half percent and the seller gives 3% is our only option to redo the agreement. Jessica, I'm not saying you can redo the agreement right now. What I'm saying is whatever you put on this form is all you're allowed to get paid. So that means that if you put two and a half percent and the seller is paying 3%, you are only getting paid two and a half percent. As of the moment, that is how it is written. That is the law of the land. That other half a percent, I don't know what happens to it other than to say the seller is probably not paying it. Um, but to redo the agreement, I know that's the question, which I said I don't have the answer to because 
I don't know if it's as simple as you emailing or them emailing you and saying, I'm going to cancel this agreement. Because let me ask you a question. If you're a consumer, think about this for a second. If, if you're the consumer and I said I was willing to work for two and a half percent, the seller is willing to pay me three percent and you're a savvy consumer. Wouldn't you then say, oh, you know what? You're getting paid 3%, but you were willing to work with me for 2.5%. Why don't you give me back that other half a percent? And I'll use that as part of my closing cost credit or my credits, right? So that's why I keep saying, like, I really don't think it's in your best interest to change this document once you've agreed on a price. Don't go up, don't go down, whatever it is, you need to show your value up front and negotiate that. And that's what you're sticking with. Because I've already seen where consumers are asking for to be reimbursed for commissions. And the other thing is, too, is if the if you're willing to work with an age uh, consumer for two and a half percent and I'm the consumer, I can guarantee you that a savvy consumer is going to say to you as the agent, you were willing to work for two and a half percent. That's fine. Let the seller pay three percent. I get a half percent back and I owe you nothing. <laughs> Right, they're paying zero. That's what I'm saying. Like they would be paying zero dollars, but if you can collect three percent and you're willing to do the amendment, then give me the other half percent that you were willing to work for less. So that that's why I would say I do not believe, Jessica, to your point, that it's in anybody's best interest to redo these documents once you've agreed on something, because it's going to come back to try and benefit you, and the consumer is going to say, "What about me?" We have one more question here. Go ahead. You can put a minimum in this. That's fine. You you have a you have an opportunity to put a minimum. Well, it. it I mean, that's the whole thing, though, is you don't know what you're going to get from the seller, if anything. That's what I mean. So the buyer. So my only I go back to this. Thing. So I go back to this. The question is, if you put in a seventy five hundred dollar minimum because you're showing a two or three hundred thousand dollar house and you put that in. You end up going to a house where the seller says, guess what? I'm going to pay you three percent. Surprise. Oh, great. I'm so excited. You put $7,500 as the minimum you would work for, and I'm the consumer. I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to say, hey, thanks for procuring 3% on this property from the seller. You agree to only get paid $7,500, so I want the difference back. It's a minimum, right? It's $7,500. No, but it's not open. It's not. That would be open-ended. You can't say, I will take $7,500 or what the seller will give me. So that there's no open endedness about this, guys. It is. And I love the questions because it shows that you're like every other agent that's going to ask these questions and try and get around that. And, and understand what you put on this form is what you're getting paid. It's that simple. Linda. And then, Linda saying she's old. Okay. We've got like a minute left for those of you that want to stick around. Great. So when we have a seller come and say, you're likely to let us know if they're going to need to bring cash to the table. Yep. Here's my concern is, especially young first time buyers, they're going to sign because I'm going to prove my value. They're going to sign whatever we sign. We're going to get to the closing table. We're going to find out they've got no money. What are we going to do about that? Because you and I both know that's going to happen. Yeah. So Linda has a great point, and I'm glad for those of you that stuck around, and then we'll let you go here. Um, the question is, typically with a seller, we go to their house, we do a net sheet, we have an idea that we're going to be able to get paid out of that. They sign an agreement that says we're going to get paid. But with a buyer, they may sign this and not understand that they are on the hook. And I think it's um, another broker had brought this up, and it's like, what do you do when you get to the closing table an additional $5,000 in commission has been added to their closing costs and they don't have. It. What are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, you can't close on the house? Or are you going to say, okay, never mind. I'm not going to get paid $5,000. Go ahead. 
and close on the house, right? We're going to want to get paid. So that's why I say when I think the word consultation, I really do feel like the consultation between you and the buyer is going to be a conversation to say, here, this 3%, understand you're bringing this. And by the way, you can do a buyer's sheet through uh, American Title Solutions or any other title company that you have. You That might be a standard practice now. Instead of just doing a seller net sheet, we might be doing a buyer settlement sheet to give them an idea of what they're going to be bringing. But to answer your question, what's going to happen when that does happen? Because it will happen. I don't know. <laughs> because it's either you're going to, it's either, it's either going to let them close on the house or you're not. We're not, but that's right. We will not get paid and the agent won't get paid. And don't get me wrong. We want to get paid as well. But my question then to you is, do I go sue that consumer for that money? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Putting liens against everybody's properties. Okay. Carol has a question. If you guys want to stick around on Zoom, you're welcome to go. But if you want to know, kind of know the questions, please stick around. I'll repeat Carol's question. Yep. That's right. I mean, right now, so the question is, if people just sign, 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 which we're used to doing, everybody just signs, what's going to happen when a consumer says, well, I didn't read what I signed? It's going to happen. But when you read it, I mean, if you go to court and you sign something, whether you read it or not, it's legally binding because you signed it. You should have read what you signed. That's, I mean, that's the old adage. But does it solve the problem that they now owe money to somebody that they can't afford? No, it doesn't. Beth is asking, if our commission is on the purchase agreement, would the lender have this on their initial disclosures? Uh, I would imagine the lender is going to have to have it on their disclosure. And I would imagine, that's a great question, Beth. Uh, a lender is going to have to know what your commission is that you're charging because they're going to need to know whether the buyer can pay you or not. And, and it's probably going to be whatever fee you put on here is going to be the worst case scenario. And then it will get better if the seller actually pays some commission, but they're not, they're going to, it's probably going to have to qualify them just like anything else on worst case scenario. So yeah, so that's a good question. All right, guys, uh, I'll keep taking some questions here uh, if you want, but I'm going to go ahead and let the people on Zoom go. Thank you. Try to get. Oh, I mean, I'm going to continue to get a buyers as much as I can. I mean, I would not. I have no interest in that.